Good morning, this is David Cross, your historical expeditionary, talking to you today from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It is yet another very, very rainy day. And what I'm going to talk to you today about is a book I have in my hand, Three Months in the Southern States by Arthur J. L. Fremantle. Uh, three months in the southern states. And let me start off by telling you that one of the things I'm going to be doing this year is making a lot of these uh, videos and some of them will be, some of them will be about um, a, a large number of these books I have about soldiers, the memoirs. I, I, I really want to delve into reading some of these journals and memoirs that was written about the Civil War. And so I'm going to be doing that. These will last about eight minutes, so some of them will be several sections. And this is a, a pretty informal discussion we'll be having. Uh, I'll, I'm going to create podcasts about some of these books. I'm sur sure I will about this one. But this is more of a discussion of just how I felt about the book. And what I'm going to do is I'll look through the book. And what I do when I read a book is I make a lot of notes in a card and I go back. And sometimes I type them out more, more formally when I'm working on a book or something like that. Other times I just end up with this card in the book that sends me into some things that uh, cause me to think about something or other. So I'm going to, I'm going to go through this and talk to you a little bit about it. Now, those of you in the know, those of you interested in the Civil War, you know who Arthur J.L. Fremantle is. He plays a somewhat large role in the movie Gettysburg. And he is the individual from England, pretty much universally portrayed in a comical way because he's English. And uh, so, so he's somewhat comical and ridiculous in Killer Angels in Gettysburg. And um, he's, been, he's been written about in other novels. But to, to me, this is a tremendous book, and I think it would make a great movie. And the reason I think it would make such a great movie is this guy's coming from a completely different place from different uh, uh, aspects, different morals, different world. And that's what we do when we're looking at the Civil War. Uh, we're interested in it. We're fascinated about it in large part because it's such a different place. It's such a foreign country to us. And it is to Arthur Fremantle, both figuratively and literally a foreign country. And he is very supportive of the South. Now, what he says at the very beginning of this book, in the preface that he writes, is that initially he supported the North, he says, because uh, he, he, he says, uh, if I had any bias, my sympathies were rather in favor of the North on account of the dislike which an Englishman naturally feels at the idea of slavery. But soon a sentiment of great admiration for the gallantry and determination of the Southerners, together with the unhappy contrast afforded by the foolish bullying conduct of the Northerners, caused a complete revulsion in my feelings, and I was unable to repress a strong wish to go to America to see something of this wonderful struggle. So in other words, initially he's opposed to slavery, but he's more opposed to the Northerners bullying over slavery. So in other words, yes, it's an ugly thing, but one must be civil and one doesn't tell others what to do even when they're putting millions of people in chains. So that's going to be a lot of this book is him looking at slavery from his perspective. And in general, he's going to find that slavery is not such a bad thing. He's going to find that... As a, He's going to find that these slaves seem pretty happy and that the only problem most of these slaves are having is that the, the, there's less food and there's less clothing because of the northerners. And that, that's the story he's going to buy. So uh, that can be offensive to modern readers. That's the way he sees it. That's the way he chooses to see it. And so, again, if you do a movie, obviously you don't have to portray it in that way. Uh, you don't have to portray the reality around him in that way while you can, of course, portray his particular opinions. But that's the way he's going to really look at this. And um, he's going to write on a number of occasions what he sees when he looks at slavery. And, and, and I'll talk to you about some of those things. Now, it's interesting, you know, the, the one of the fun things about this book is it's just an, kind of an adventure book. He has to go to uh, St. Thomas. He has to go around 
to get to the south because of the northern blockade. So he's not going to try to run the blockade. So a lot of this is just kind of travel stuff and what it's like. I mean, one of the things that that I noted as soon as when I was reading this was his his mention of drinking salt water coffee. And I thought, wow, I'd never heard of that. Salt water coffee? And I've thought about that ever since. I looked it up before doing this video. I said, let me see if anyone writes about salt water coffee. It kept coming up as a phrase people were using, but nobody ever talked about actually drinking salt water coffee or why you would, other than you know, he's probably doing it Fremantle because there's no, there's very little fresh water around to use. Uh, there's a, there's a nice coffee shop. Evidently, I haven't been there, but there's a coffee shop in Australia. Gave a tour to a, a lady from Australia yesterday. Coffee shop in Australia called uh, Saltwater Coffee. Um, those are the little, little touches when you read these things that you don't get in any other way. You know, you're not gonna, you're reading a biography, you're reading a battle discussion, um, you're reading uh, a book on the Civil War, you're probably not gonna run into this idea of drinking saltwater coffee. But it's one of these little things that just gives you a flavor and, and a hint about what's actually going on out there. Uh, one of the things I really enjoyed seeing. Now, has a really interesting beginning, though, uh, because he talks about a what he calls a mistreatment of an individual. Um, once he starts running into Southerners, uh, mistreatment of this man, Montgomery. He writes, I understand that this Montgomery was a man of very bad character. Well, I hope so. He finds him slightly buried, but his head and arms were above the ground, his arms tied together, the rope still hanging round his neck, but part of it still dangling from quite a small mesquite tree. Dogs or wolves had probably scraped the earth from the body, and there was no flesh on the bones. I obtained this, my first experience of lynch law, within three hours of landing in America. Lynch law. Now, now when we hear the phrase lynch law, it's anti-lynching, right? Uh, you know, everybody wanted Franklin Roosevelt to create anti-lynching legislation. Well, what Franklin Roosevelt managed to do brilliantly when, he, when the Democratic Party was these two completely dissimilar factions, which you have George Wallace, who's, of course, very pro-South, a very anti-civil rights, and you have Hubert Humphrey and Adlai Stevenson, who are the strongest civil rights advocates. So you have this crazy party. We're seeing some of that happen in our parties today, where they, they hold very dissimilar views. You have this crazy party. Ultimately, by the way, a party has to choose. Uh, and that's what happened when, in my view, it happened when John F. Kennedy made his civil rights speech, which he woke up that day not knowing he was going to make that speech. He made that speech somewhat on the spur of the moment, although I think he knew what he was doing. I think John Kennedy had had decided it was time to just make that swap. Okay, I won the South in 1960. I won Alabama. I won Mississippi. I won Texas, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'm kissing away the South, but I'm going to win California, which I lost to Nixon. And so he's he's starting that reevaluation and that transformation of what the parties are going to become. But anyway, when when Fremantle talks about the Lynch law, he's talking about the unwritten law. You don't mess with the South or you get lynched. And that's what happened to this terrible fellow, Montgomery, uh, what did Montgomery do? Well, he was a man of bad character. Uh, he was in the habit of calling the Confederates all sorts of insulting epithets. <laughs> and this had roused the fury of the Confederates, uh, evidently. So anyway, um, this, this is an interesting book. And, and, and it dives right into the, the reality of this situation. Uh, so anyway, uh, 
I'm going to be doing I'm going to be doing probably three episodes about this book this week, and uh, so let me just uh, let me just end off with that. But um, I will I will return to get deeper into this really interesting book, three months in the southern states, and so uh, check back in, and I will be telling you about uh, I'll be telling you more about this book in two days.